So, yeah, I, if I wasn't so happy and excited and generally totally thrilled and slightly jet-lagged and everything, I'd be slightly almost crying. Probably would, almost. Because imagine, like, imagine you arrive at a strange airport in a strange country and you see a bus, and on this bus is a, is a little piece of paper, and on the piece of paper is the two words that you wrote about 10 years ago. I, I wrote these maybe 11 years ago, yeah. Um, and um, imagine that that's like the theme of this massive project that these lovely, sweet people who organized this have been doing for years and years and years. And imagine that they've invited you not only once, but twice. Okay, so I have to sort of slightly stop talking now because I might get a bit, uh, you know, but instead of doing that, I think what we should do really right now, because I think this is probably my job, um, possibly for the rest of my life, actually, is to, is to th say thank you to all the organizers. And there are so many of them that I'm not going to name them, but we need to do a big, big round of applause for all the people who organized this. It's unbelievable. Wow. And I'm talking about... I'm, and, I'm, and I'm talking about not just this year, but the, like the last many, many years, you know? So anyway, um, thank you for having me again. It's a great honor. And, you know, also, like, wow, you, you, you took this <coughs> phrase and you fleshed it out into actual, like, art and stuff, you know, like, thank you for laughing. Um, I, at the time, didn't have much of a clue as to what it was, you know, I mean, I basically wrote a few adverts about it, you know, and then finally I ended up writing this book about it, but I was only able to really write the book about it after I'd done the first trip, you know, so, like, I feel very much that the way I think is sort of following art rather than, like, in front. You know, some philosophers think that, that like, they're Pac-Man, you know, and, and, and what they're supposed to do is, like, sort of eat everything. I'm sort of the opposite, you know. I'm happy to be pac man by by you. Okay, so <laughs> keep on chewing me. Um, okay, so this is called Dark Ecological Chocolate for some incons uh, uh, sort of uh, unbelievable reason. Let's see what it actually says. Thank you for laughing again. Um, dark ecology starts off as depressing. Then it becomes dark as in mysterious, then it ends as dark as in sweet, dark chocolate. In this lecture, I'm going to provide an experiential map of dark ecology, a phenomenology, to be more precise. What are the chemicals that make up ecological awareness? I'm going to argue that they form a very distinctive pattern and that we're traversing through this pattern right now as if we were eating into a chocolate. But we were only on our first or second bite. There are two more big bites to go. On the third bite, all kinds of deliciously flavored liquids start to pour out in a way that I like to think of in a very basic set theoretical way, a way that subverts the basic theistic, hence patriarchal, agri-logistical belief that we, that, that we seem to be keep on retweeting, that holes are bigger than the sums of their parts, an idea that has no basis in logic at all. Well, that sentence started off really nice and ended up in set theory. Sorry about that. Once we have a feel for the phenomenology, we can figure out what kinds of art process and practice we want to involve ourselves in with a much greater sense of power and accuracy, he said wittily. Where we're going to land is pleasure, sexuality, or to be more precise, sexualities. I wouldn't dare to spell out everything in this region, but I think I found the airport, which is more than you can say for some pilots of some planes to Kirkenes, he hinted. <laughs> That is, I think I found the airport where the ecological art lives. It's a pleasure airport. It's not an efficiency airport. I never ever want to visit the efficiency airport. Why? Because the efficiency airport is a petroculture airport. If you think that ecological art is key to the denial and policing of pleasure, then you're still messing around in petro space, and this is precisely the problem, no? The basic chemical of pleasure space is intimacy, and the basic chemical of intimacy is solidarity. So let's explore that for a moment. That feeling, and more than a feeling, of being one with. Solidarity describes a state of physical and political organization, and it describes a feeling. This itself is interesting because it cuts against a dominant default ontological trend, default since the basic social, psychic, and philosophical foreclosure of the human, non-human, symbiotic, real, that we call the Neolithic. Let's think up a dramatic Game of Thrones sounding name for it. Let's call it The Severing. Why this dramatic name? Well, I really do think that it's some kind of trauma that we keep on reenacting on and among ourselves, and obviously on and among other life forms. It creates a basic in itself trauma. I was so happy that Heather mentioned the word sever yesterday. It was so perfect, yeah. 
It creates a basic, in itself, traumatic fissure between, to put it in those starkly cut and dried Lacanian terms, reality, the human correlated world, and the real ecological symbiosis of human and non-human parts of the biosphere. The cut and driedness of the Lacanian model is itself an artifact of the severing, derived in large part from Hegel's defensive reaction against the shockwave sent by Kant's correlationist ontology. For Hegel, the difference between what a thing is and how it appears is internal to the subject, which in the largest sense for him is Geist, that magical slinky that can go upstairs all the way to the top where the Prussian state hangs out. The thing in itself is totally foreclosed. Thought only is an artifact of the strong correlationist thought space. Strong correlationist as opposed to weak correlationist, which is Kant and OOO, where there is a gap, but it's not inside the subject, it's in the thing or things, however many there are. I'm not the object police, so I can't tell you. I'm fonder of Lyotard's way of thinking about all this. For Lyotard, the real reality boundary must be perforated like a sponge. Stuff leaks through. It makes better Freudian sense too. There is a loose, thick, wavy line between things and their phenomena expressed in the dialectical tension between what Lyotard calls discourse and what he calls figure. Figure can bleed into discourse, by which Lyotard means something physical, non-representational, silent, perhaps in the sense that Freud describes the drives as silent. Figure can melt out of discourse like cherry-flavoured liquid melting out of a chocolate. So solidarity in this light means human, psychic, social and philosophical being resisting the severing. This is not as hard as it seems because the basic symbiotic real requires no maintaining by human thought or psychic activity. We've been telling ourselves that humans, in particular human thought, makes things real for so long that this sounds absurd or impossible. That's basically correlationism 101, you know, like there is a reality, but it's not real until you make it real somehow. It's like the, there is a light in the refrigerator, but you can only know that if you open the fridge. That's basically what we're saying. Solidarity, a thought and a feeling in a physical and political state, seems in its pleasant confusion of feeling with and being with, appearing and being phenomena and thing to be not just gesturing to this non-severed real, but to emerge from it. Since in a way it is just the noise that symbiosis is already making. In this way, solidarity is not only the nicest feeling and political state and so on, it's also the cheapest and most readily available, precisely because it relies on the basic default symbiotic real. Solidarity is a word used for the fact, as the Oxford English Dictionary puts it, of being perfectly united or at one. And solidarity is also used for the constitution of a group as such, the example given being the notorious notion of the human race, aka species, aka the dreaded anthropos of the dreaded Anthropocene, which we all need to be thinking in all kinds of ways rather than wishing this embarrassing seeming generalization. Embarrassing seeming uh, race, class, and gender specificity stripping enlightenment horror, and lurking behind this another transparent monster, the concept of species as such. And solidarity can mean community. In other words, solidarity presses all the wrong buttons for us post-68 new left educated people. No wonder Hart and Negri spend so much time finessing it into a diffuse deterritorial feeling of rhizomatic something or other at the end of their magnum opus, Empire. We want something like solidarity to be as unsolid and as untogether as possible. We want something perhaps like the community of those who have nothing in common, Lingus, a community of unworking or in operation, Nasi. On the other hand, we're obsessed with systems and how they emerge magically from simple differences that, in the Batesonian lingo, make a difference. In other words, we're either resisting an agricultural age religion or we're promoting it by other means. In either case, we're operating with reference to agricultural religion, which is the experiential, social, and thought mode 1.0, if you like, of the severing. Houston, we have a problem. What is the default characteristic of this thought mode? It is what I am now calling explosive holism, which is kind of like explosive diarrhea in a funny way, but <laughs> it's more like what I have, explosive verbal diarrhea. Sorry about that. Explosive holism is a belief Never formally proved, but retweeted everywhere all the time that the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. Either you are down with that because you were a traditional theist or you were into cybernetics or any number of deployments of this concept, or you are the kind who shows their behind to the political father, as Roland Barthes puts it. You are in church or you are thumbing your nose at church. In either case, there is a church, and that is the problem. 
Truly getting over Neolithic theism and its various upgrades would be equivalent to achieving ecological awareness in social, psychic, and philosophical space. Because these modes of coexisting and thinking and feeling are artifacts of the severing, it would be tantamount to allowing at least some of the symbiotic real to bleed through into human thought space, let alone human social and psychic space. So it sounds quite important. And I claim that what's blocking our ability to do so is in part a deep and therefore structural set theory that thinks wholes as greater than the sum of their parts. Such a theory turns wholes, community, biosphere, aka nature, capital N in this case, the universe, the God in whose angry hands we are sinners, into a being radically different from us, radically bigger, transcendentally bigger, aka you can't get there from here, some kind of gigantic invisible being that is inherently hostile to us. We're about to be subsumed. The drop is going to be absorbed into the ocean. Western prejudice is about Buddhism, perhaps, our negative thoughts about explosive holism, leaking into the thought space conditioned by that very holism, projected onto a so-called Eastern religion. It isn't very difficult to discern within this fear of absorption into the whole, along with its ecstatic shadow, the traditional patriarchal horror of the simple fact that, full respect to Levi Strauss, we came from others. The way contemporary Hegelian psychoanalytic prose seems to, who am I thinking of, seems to juice itself on the uncanny over and over again is an in some ways quite embarrassing Stockholm Syndrome-like constant reassertion needing to be a re-reasserted to maintain the strong real reality boundary that we came out of vaginas. I mean, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. The moment at which it isn't a big deal, and so no longer uncanny in the sense of horrifying, though perhaps uncanny in the softer sense of being irreducibly strange, because it involves undecidable host-parasite symbiotic logics, is the moment at which imperial neoliberal Western patriarchal thought space will have collapsed. And that's an idea I thought was worth sharing. <laughs> I'm never going to do a TED talk, you know. The fossil fuel economy is a culture of energy that conditions us to hold incompatible, symmetrically flawed versions of alienation. And not only do you lose something when you opt for one or the other, you are just messing about in petro space. On the one hand, alienation means you're separated from some identifiable essence of the human from nature. Appearances are fake. Or alienation means you're conditioned to think that there is some essence precisely. The essence is fake. Either way, you're deprived of the symbiotic real the one in which appearing and being are deeply, irreducibly intertwined in a way that the trickster-like beings of first people's cultures exemplify. You're stuck with fake appearance or fake reality. You can't get here to the symbiotic real from there, the anthropocentric correlationist essentialist theories of alienation. You're stuck with some kind of severing of intimacy with physical being, with life forms, with pleasures, and I'm the kind of communist who thinks it's about more about pleasure than consumerism, not less, more pleasure than consumerism, not less, so that consumerism shows a not exactly clearly lighted but nevertheless lighted path to the exit. Sorry, eco-Puritans. That's one of the big problems, actually. We think the ecological future in the key of oil, in other words, in the key of a restricted economy, we think about restraint, we think about guilt and redemption, we think about getting the A from the latest upgrade of the invisible patriarch, even if her new name is Gaia. So we're not going to go to explosive holism. We're going to go with implosive holism, which I call subsendence, a.k.a. the whole is always less than the sum of its parts. It's actually incredibly easy to understand if you accept that if things exist, then they exist in the same way. That's basically your object of the thing. A whole is one. The parts that comprise it are, by definition, more than one. They exist equally with the whole, so the whole is always less than them. Right, so, you know, we've got this microphone, right, and it's just, let's just assume it exists, right? I don't know, because I'm not the object police. Okay, and the, and, and, this, and the mic is one, yeah? And then you've got all the microphone parts, and they're obviously more than one, and they exist in the same way, so there's always more parts than whole. Okay, bingo. Super easy, yeah? Why does it sound so counterintuitive? That's the interesting thing. I find this seemingly bizarre idea incredibly easy to think, like letting yourself slide down a water slide. It sounds daft, but only because the patriarchal agri-logistical programming is telling you that it's daft and that water slides are dangerous. Sometimes it's useful in life to subtract the content of the thought and look at the attitude with which it's being held. It's not exactly what you think, but how you think 
that poses the problem. So we should examine not the content of ecological thoughts, but the attitude with which those thoughts are held, attitudes that are mutually constitutive of the reality they describe. These attitudes are all about how we relate to pleasure. Each deeper layer of the chocolate is a phenomenological reduction of the layer around it. That's what I just said in, like, polysyllables. The outer sugar coating is guilt, a very low-resolution version of what we discover as we descend into the chocolate. Guilt is intimately connected with reification. It's pleasure upside down. Thou shalt not enjoy thyself, which is a fantastic way of enjoying yourself. We will find different kinds of laughter in the different layers of the chocolate. Laughter here is guilty laughter, the uneasy laughter of someone who begins to feel complicit in what they're finding out, the laughter of secret enjoyment. As we bite into the chocolate, we'll see that each region has an upper and a lower bound. The upper bound of guilt proclaims that you can somehow get rid of the guilt. The lower bound tells you that guilt is irreducible. You'll never be able to shake it off, which brings us to shame. The chocolate layer underneath the sugar is shame, just as shame is chronologically prior to guilt in childhood and in human history. Shame does have some ecological functionality because it's deeply connected to being with. I feel it when I feel others looking at me, yet I feel like killing myself or killing the other when I feel shame. The upper bound of the shame is a violent thrashing whereby I try to rid myself of the stain. Here we find a shameful laughter that hides and reveals our deep physical complicity with other beings above and beyond the complicity of our enjoyment, guilt. But the lower bound is just the trace of violence, objection, abjection. Subjects are created when they force themselves to think that they are not made up of abject stuff, aka the symbiotic real starts to make itself felt. As in the phrase, shame on you. I can't actually wipe it off. At this boundary, there is a recognition of trauma, an acknowledgement that we never wiped away the vomit, and never could, and by extension, our body, our ancestors in our bones, the fish swim bladders in our lungs, the bacteria in our guts, the phantasms. We think about toxic plastics dripping down our throat when we drink an innocent glass of water. We experience symbiosis as trauma. Without explicit content, what would the aesthetics of shame feel like? James Turrell is a minimalist sculptor of photons, and his works employ subtle, gorgeous electronic light. Turrell is exquisitely attuned to the elemental, a givenness without explicit content, vivid and intense, not blank. One is immersed in vibrant color that seems to come there, yeah, that seems to come all the way to the tip of one's nose, like rain or cold or tropical humidity. Abjection is elemental. It's not surprising then that modernity, capitalism and individualism have had trouble with the elemental, seeking to banish it from their easy wipe surfaces. The other word for this elemental givenness is magic. Let's jump further into the fog. It's hard to laugh here, overwhelmed and fascinated by the given. Perhaps just a nervous snicker, like the quiet chuckles as the laughter dies away at the haunting close of Pink Floyd's Welcome to the Machine. The room goes quiet, everyone is looking. The laughter dies down, and we find ourselves in a space I call the melancholy, the cherry-flavoured centre of the chocolate. We've been hurt by the things that happened to us, but in a way, to be a thing at all is to have been hurt. We are scarred with the traces of object cathexes. Trauma is not only human. The beautiful ridges in the glass are traces of the glass's own lost object cathexes. Things are printed with other things. Something about trauma is non-human. Something about pages that stick together as well, blimey. The upper bound of the melancholy is an encounter with horror. Tragedy is the highest form of horror art. We become Oedipus, putting his eyes out because he sees clearly. Oedipus from the lineage of weaponized agriculture. Here lives the maniacal laughter of horror, but for all our vivid awareness, we're still very much in anthropocentric space. We try to straighten out loops and find the perfect metaposition. In the horror, we encounter the uncanny valley. In robotics design, it's common to note how the closer an android resembles a human, the more disturbing it appears. Zombies live in the uncanny valley because they ironically embody Cartesian dualism. They are animated corpses. The uncanny valley concept explains racism and is itself racist. Its decisive separation of the healthy human being, that's what it says, and the cute R2-D2 type robot, 
not to mention Hitler's dog Blondie, of whom he was very fond, opens up a forbidden zone of uncanny beings that reside scandalously in the excluded middle region. So if you go on Wikipedia and you look at it, it's like healthy human being, and then over there sort of R2-D2, right, and then and there's this sort of dip, right, and there's all these sort of abject figures in that, in that uncanny valley. R2-D2 and Blondie are cute because they are decisively different and less powerful. You know Blondie, like the reason why the pop singers call that is because of Hitler's dog, yeah? As we descend through the abject realm of the melancholy, the uncanny valley smoothens itself out into a gigantic flat plane, the spectral plane. Ecological awareness takes place on the spectral plane, whose distortion, the uncanny valley, severs the human and non-human worlds in a rigid way that spawns the disavowed region of objects that are also subjects. A rigid and thin concept of life is what dark ecology rejects. A future society in which being ecological became a mode of violence still more horrifying than the neoliberalism that now dominates Earth would consist of a vigorous insistence on life and related categories such as health. If that is, the future, if that is what future coexistence means, beam me up, Scotty. In ecological awareness, differences between R2-D2-like beings and humans become far less pronounced. It's pretty obvious, right? Because, you know, in evolution theory, you know, the difference between life and non-life becomes very really blurry, right? And the difference between conscious and non-conscious becomes very really blurry when you start thinking about it, and so on and so on. Everything gains a haunting spectral quality. The Nazi tactic of peeling off abjection while supporting animal rights isn't inconsistent at all. Scientistic speculative realism also lives in the horror, the top level of the realm of objection, the level where we've not yet discovered the spectral plane. A masochistic machismo reigns, according to which I prove that my upside-down satanic version of an axial age monotheistic god, perhaps it's called Cthulhu, who wants to kill me, is much more horrific than yours. Depression can lead... It's basically just male threat display, isn't it, eh? Thank you for laughing. Depression can lead to an autoimmune syndrome, just like an allergic reaction, cleansing the world of ghosts and spirits, the pathetic sensations and feelings. That's what accelerationism is hoping for. The name of this hope is despair. The deadly seriousness of Justine in Lars von Trier's Melancholia is evocative of speculative realist horror. Quote, we are alone in the universe. I know things. This isn't scientifically accurate, though it claims to be. We've become allergic to chocolate, to pleasure, but we're too far in. We can't make our way back up to good old guilt. We need to find an alternative to horror as a host for intellect, not aside from intellect, but inside. We need to find within horror some form of laughter. The face of horror knowledge is nothing but the face of the boy, underline boy, Macaulay Culkin, in Home Alone. The stereotype behavior of someone locked into their style without knowing is inherently funny. Laughter becomes ridicule. Without quite realizing it at first, we've entered a region called the realm of toys. This is a mad chocolate, isn't it? It's like a huge kind of Dungeons and Dragons kind of a chocolate with the realm of toys in the middle. And the first toy is the style of horror, exclamation mark. We'll shortly discover that the realm of toys provides the blueprint for an ecological polity, a polity that includes non-humans as well as humans. An ecological politics based on guilt underlines return to nature tactics. Basing politics on horror necessitates some kind of resignation tinged with schadenfreude. The realm of toys is much more playful and pleasurable. A life form, an engineering solution, a social policy, another life form, they join together and become another type of toy in a sort of ecological Lego. Because of interdependence, there's always a missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle. There never can be the toy, one toy to rule them all. Toys connect humans with non-humans, a child's hand with a robot's arm, a piece of lettuce with a rabbit, and toys are non-humans in themselves. An ecological future is toys at every scale, without a top level that makes everything sensible once and for all. Perhaps that was the problem all along. Suddenly, horror appears ridiculous, and another kind of laughter breaks out. In the middle of John Carpenter's movie, The Thing, when it couldn't get much worse, the viral morphing, oozing alien who imitates others, tricking and then devouring, imitating those who interact with it, has absorbed one of the characters in the Antarctic research station. The remaining crew are busy blowtorching most of the dripping thing, but some of the thing's mass escapes their attention in the form of the head of its latest victim. 
Under the table, the upside-down head sprouts spider-like legs and begins to crawl out of the door, emitting weird breath-like distorted... This really happened, by the way. This is not acid or anything. Like, it actually is in a movie. Emitting weird breath-like distorted moans. It is at this point that one of the crew utters the immortal words, you got to be fucking kidding. Upon which they torch the spider head. We are in the sub-region of the ridiculous. So you've got... This region has got a lot of regions to it. It's got the horror, and then you've got the ridiculous, one level down, yeah? We're in the sub-region of the ridiculous, where we encounter the art of the absurd. In this sub-region, toys appear to be demonic puppets. There is a toying around at this level, a mistreatment. The ridiculous is a realm of satire and sarcasm, comedy with something missing. A metaness ling lingers here. At some point, you want to stop applying flames to contradictory toys. You start to collect them. A less violent objection broods here, like a pale mist. It's almost beautiful. We are now in the sub-region called the Ethereal. We discover the whimsical toys of Kitsch. The Ethereal is suffused with a strange goth feeling, like the room of replicant designer J.F. Sebastian in Blade Runner. Goth here means the abject and highly popular underside of romanticism, slightly too melodramatic and dark, and inclusive of pleasure, but a weird pleasure. Baudelaire. Intrigued by his objection, sitting alone and feeling weird without recoiling in horror and without contextualizing his experience, as if beauty was still possible, but only on condition that we drop the anthropocentrism and relate to a truly unconditional beauty, including the unconditionality of no human standard of taste. The fringing of beauty with fascination, disgust and fear, without trying to airbrush them out of the picture. Kitsch is other people's inevitably weird or disgusting enjoyment objects, evoking the intrinsically non-human aspect of enjoyment as such. But this gives rise to a very valuable insight. Even when I'm having it, enjoyment isn't mine. It subsends my conceptual grasp. I'm sorry to break it to the avant-garde, but in an ecological age, art will burst open into all kinds of funky pleasure, because there will be no single authoritative scale from which to judge. The unshocking idea that art should shock the bourgeoisie out of its complacency is what needs to be gently folded and put away. As we melt into the melancholy, the difference some want to maintain between interest and fascination evaporates as the not-me object exerts its gravitational pull. The guardian of this region is Wally, the garbage-collecting robot, who maintains a collection of gadgets and trinkets that humans have left behind on a trashed, uninhabitable earth. There are no longer piles of trash because there is no longer anthropocentrism. Fascinated, I begin to laugh with non-humans rather than at them, horror or ridicule, or and and at with my f or and or at and with my fellow humans about them, shame and guilt. The melancholy doesn't know what the toys want, but it does know they want something. That there might be unknown pleasures, thanks Joy Division. Something strangely beautiful lies in the region below, the boundary region between depression and the strange beauty. Trying to escape depression is depressing. We begin to recognize this loop as a hollowing out. The hollowing of depression in turn is recognized as a thing, which is to say a thing in all its withdrawn mystery. We are in a region called the hollow. We are collapsing down, subsending into a throng of more and more real objects. By real, I mean not reified, not depending on a subject, not undermined or overmined, not reduced to atoms or fluxes or processes, or reduced upwards to correlates of some decider. A weird joke is in process. Perhaps its style is best caught by Sid Barrett, inventor of glam and goth and whimsical toys, out of his mind and depressed and sad, and the piper at the gates of dawn. And this is like the last thing he sings on a Pink Floyd album. And the sea isn't green, and I love the queen, and what exactly is a dream, and what exactly is a joke. Now you see me, now you don't. Fleeting laughter res resounds. We begin to enjoy contradiction, and the sea isn't green. We begin to relax our defense against ontological paranoia, and what exactly is a dream. We relish ambiguity. What exactly is a joke? Inside the congealed hollow is a liquid sadness. This sadness is a liquid inside the wounds. It does not have an object, it is an object, and the best image for this OOO kind of object is a liquid. This being an object is intimately related with the Kantian beauty experience, wherein I find experiential evidence without metaphysical positing that at least one other being exists. 
The sadness is the attunement of coexistence stripped of its conceptual content. Since the rigid anthropocentric standard of taste with its refined distances has collapsed, it becomes at this level impossible to rebuild the distinction that we lost in the ethereal between being interested or concerned with this painting, this polar bear, and being fascinated by. Being interested means I'm in charge. Being fascinated means something else is in charge. Beauty starts to show the subsendent wiring under the board. Take Björk. Her song Hyper Ballad is a classic example of what I'm trying to talk about here. She shows you the wiring under the board of an emotion. The way of straightforward feeling like I love you is obviously not straightforward at all. So don't write a love song like that. Write one that says you're sitting on top of this cliff and you're dropping bits and pieces of, off the edge like car parts, bottles and cutlery, all kinds of not you, non-human prosthetic bits that we take to be extensions of our totally integrated, up-to-date, shiny, religious, holistic selves. And then you picture throwing yourself off. And what would you look like? to the you who's watching you still on the edge of the cliff as you fell. And when you hit the bottom, would you be alive or dead? Would you look awake or asleep? Would your eyes be closed or open? When you experience beauty, you experience evidence in your inner space that at least one thing that isn't you exists, an evanescent footprint in your inner space. You don't need to prove that things are real by hitting them or eating them, a non-violent coexisting without coercion. There is an undecidability between two entities, me and not me, the thing. Beauty is sad because it's ungraspable. There is an elegiac quality to it. When we grasp, it withdraws, like putting my hand into water. Yet it appears. Beauty is virtual. I'm unable to tell whether the beauty resides in me or in the thing. It is as if it were in the thing, but impossible to pin down there. The subjunctive, floating, as if virtual reality of beauty is a little queasy. The thing emits a tractor beam in whose vortex I find myself. I veer towards it. The aesthetic dimension says something true about causality in a modern age. I can't tell for sure what the causes and effects are without resorting to illegal metaphysical moves. Something slightly sinister is afoot. There is a basic entanglement such that I can't tell who or what started it. Beauty is the givenness of data. A thing impinges on me before I can contain it or use it or think it. It is as if I hear the thing breathing right next to me. From the standpoint of agricultural white patriarchy, something slightly evil is happening. Something already has a grip on us, and this is demonic insofar as it is from elsewhere. This saturated demonic proximity is the essential ingredient of ecological being and ecological awareness, not some nature over yonder. Interdependence, which is ecology, is sad and contingent. Because of interdependence, when I'm nice to a bunny rabbit, I'm not being nice to bunny rabbit parasites. Amazing violence would be required to try to fit a form over everything all at once. If you try, then you basically undermine the bunnies and everything else into components of a machine, replaceable components whose only important aspect is their existence. I assume you're sensitively aware of the ecological emergency we call the present which has been happening in various forms for 12,000 years. It is that there are logical limits on caring, a function of interdependence. Even the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara couldn't save all sentient beings at once. This is why his head exploded into a thousand heads. He subsends himself. His two eyes burst into a thousand. That's what compassion, which is the beauty feeling, feels like. It's here that we encounter a deeper laughter than the laughter of absurdity, the laughter is about feeling a thing, be being unable to grasp it or knowing something, but of being unable to describe it. The style of a thing is always the slapstick impersonation of a thing. Toys in this region are silly. Here we arrive at a truly comic level, the breadth of coexistence. Giddy laughter begins to break out. Inside that sadness liquid, we reach a region called the longing. In the sadness, we encounter at a certain point love for no reason, unconditional love. This isn't different from longing, not a fullness denied by the supposed shallowness of longing. Why long for a polar bear or a forest or indeed a human? There is no good reason. The movement down here towards the center of the chocolate is from compassion to passion, the possibility condition for compassion. Longing is like depression that melted. The laughter of longing is a laughter of released energy no longer tied to a concept or an objectified object of any kind, free-floating, amazed at its abundance. 
And why longing? Because of joy. Finally, we hit the, the center, yeah? The basic toy-like nature of things means that reality fundamentally is playful, dancing, raving, elemental. The laughter of joy is full-on utter hilarity, accurately tracking ontological hilarity. Art begins to sound like dance music. To locate the pathway towards the joy, we'll need to examine how things become too serious. When you're funny, it means that you allow the irreducible gap between what you are and who you think you are to manifest without tampering with it. You're radically accepting your finitude. The tears of a clown form of comedic depression is when the intellect can't bear mortality and finitude. It wants you to live forever. The logical conclusion to this path is the suicidal elimination of the host, like going into anaphylactic shock. The agricultural logistics that now dominates Earth is depression, manifesting in global space in an explosive holist form. The whole point is to fight one's way back from the brink, species-sidal and suicidal, towards the comedy. The neurologist Adam Kaplan asserts the worst part of depression is that it narrows the field of vision into a very small tube so they can't see the options. Maximum tube compression, as far as my experiences of depression have been concerned, has consisted of five minutes into the future and five minutes into the past. True fact. Humans find it hard to survive if their temporality is restricted to a diameter of 10 minutes. Again, there is an ecological resonance here. Agri-logistics compresses temporality to diameters that are dangerous to life forms, including humans, and how we inhabit Earth and coexist with other beings affects us too. Thinking that you or they can snap out of it is addiction speak akin to what Gregory Bateson calls the heroic style of alcoholism. I can master myself. The trouble is that this thought is itself depression. Agri-logistics is a one-size-fits-all depression temporality, a sad, rigid, thin, grey tube. We're living inside depression, objectified in built space. With its tiny temporality window, agri-logistical depression space has turned the surface of Earth into a fatal place. As we've seen, there is a simple Freudian idea for a fatal compulsion that keeps on retweeting, death drive. Now, to think the joy, we simply invert these parameters. The joy is flavored chili, by the way, I've decided. Instead of the fatal game of mastering oneself, we realize the irony of being caught in a loop and how that irony does not bestow escape velocity from the loop. Irony and sincerity intertwine. This irony is joy, and the joy is erotic. As Jeffrey Kripal says about neosis, this is thought having sex with itself. Something is there, the elemental givenness of symbiotic reality. Relation between a thing, relation between a being and itself is the possibility condition for any other relating. The warm safety of the sadness depends upon the safety and care of the longing, which in turn depends upon the basic effervescence of the joy, an uncontainable, subsendent welling up. This attunement is itself ecological because joy functions without me. This joy is not despite me, despite the tree, the seagull, the lichen. It is the elixir of their finitude. In a sense, all toys are sex toys to the extent that they enable links between beings and between a being. In the joy, there is an excess of links between a being over links between different beings. Is it too ungrammatical to say, between the same being? Between the being that is oneself, even between thinking and itself. Although cloning is chronologically prior to sex, perhaps sex is logically prior to cloning. We consider here not, certainly not a heteronormative sex, but sex for its own sake, whose prototype is denigrated as narcissistic. The joy is logically prior to life, Deep inside life, the quivering between two deaths. Deep in the interior of life, there are dancing puppets. Something radically non-utilitarian, outside life, capital L, bankrolls evolution's ev utilitarian appearance with its play, empathy, and mutual aid. Something radically non-utilitarian is a possibility condition for the work of evolution, culture, and agriculture, steam engines, and the adult world. In fully realized ecological awareness, the chocolate has been turned inside out. A tiny crystal of gilt sugar is contained within a little ball of shame, enveloped in a congealed sphere of melancholia, swimming in a galaxy of sadness contained within a plasma field of joy. This plasma field is a Gansfeld effect of affect, as in a blizzard or a light installation by James Turrell, where one's sense of distance evaporates. I find myself thrown out of my habitual sense of where I stop and start, 
just as much as the curving walls and soft yet luminous colours melt the difference between over here and over there. Abjection has been transfigured into what Arigare calls nearness, a pure givenness in which something is so near that one cannot have it, a fact that obviously applies also to one's self. The joy is not abstract or uniform, but so intimate you can't see it, and you can't tell whether it's inside or outside, the cellular experience of bonds tightening between beings. The joy is haptic, elemental, so close that you lose track of something to be seen. Here, thought itself is a way of getting high. Human attunement to thinking has been intoxicated into recognizing its non-human status. Not simply thinking ecologically, the ecological thought, but rather thought as susceptibility, thinking as such as ecology, the structure of thought as non-human. Because of subsendence, which is that the whole is always less than the sum of its parts, right? There must be pleasure modes that can't be co-opted. But we have to get to them by embracing the world we're in now, rather than trying to fix agricultural society 9.0 via agricultural society 3.0, or whatever. Unfortunately, all that stuff about need versus desire, which also affects things like Marxist theory, is about that kind of fix. We have to drop the illusion of some unsullied, straight-up need that got twisted into desire. We have to go all the way through desire. I think these excessive pleasure modes will definitely be found in the regions and edges where humans and non-humans touch in all sorts of ways, social, psychic, philosophical, physical. This is because consumerism is anthropocentrically scaled, and so when you get really close up to a thing, it stops being anthropocentrically functional and thus ceases to be functional for consumerism, which is agricultural religion 9.0, or what have you. Percy Shelley writes, Rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number. Ye are many, they are few. He forgot to add, not just in an empirical sense, having to do with bodies you can count, but in an ontological sense, having to do with the structure of how things actually are. We are many, all the way down, because we are wholes that are always less than the sum of their parts. We don't just combine into multitudes, we contain multitudes, as any self-respecting stomach bacterium will tell you. We are many in the ontological sense too, and this implies that we can, should, and will achieve solidarity with at least some non-human beings. The pathway towards this solidarity is at least partially about increasing and enhancing and differentiating more and more pleasures. Far from creating a restricted economy, that would be a disastrous repetition of the oil economy, where concepts such as efficiency and sustainability, both perfectly anthropocentrically, not to mention neoliberally scaled, have wreaked havoc on happiness, whether one is human or not. Talk of efficiency and sustainability are simply artifacts of the relentless use of fossil fuels. In a solar economy, you could have a disco in every single room of your house and no life form would suffer, or at least vanishingly few, compared to simply turning on the lights in an oil economy. You could have strobes and decks and lasers all day and night. To your heart's content. Thank you very much. Thank you.